If you are you guys willing to get real? I don't really want to get real because my whole life is a fantasy. Is this a That's test? true. Well, um, actually, if we are being real, uh, you owe me five pounds in expenses because um, like, I sort of went to Weatherspoons because I was coming here to do this recording, so I had to get a Weatherspoons. So <coughs> if you could send if reimburse, you, if you could. If you could reimburse me from the, from I feel I feel sorry pot. for the people outside of the UK who don't know what Weatherspoons is. Well, I've got a lovely pub lunch uh, on the on the three T well, RPG. Lovely. Yeah, but we've already spent the Patreon money, so oh, okay. Yeah, so is that so you can fuck buddy? off. <laughs> and and just for the record, listeners, we've never spent the Patreon money on pub lunches, and if we have. Well, it was out of weather spoons, and, and well, so it was important. value for money. No, no, but for, uh, wait, further disclaimer: we've never spent it on anything. We're just sitting happy, mate. Um, you know, we're just like, waiting for the apocalypse. We're, we save, we're saving up for a holiday to Barbados. Yes. Apparently the RPG scene there is fucking great. <laughs> um, speaking of RPGs, uh, this is the 3T RPG podcast. My name is Harrison of Huntingshire, and with me is Sir Sean of Huntingdon. Hello. And, of course, we've got James Clark, the court jester. <laughs> Hi, guys. I know, I, know, I know what you're thinking, listener. Where the fuck is... Oh, we're recording in the same room today, by the way, which is great. But I know what you're thinking. Where, where the fuck is Nick? And, like, uh, yeah, well, Nick's not here. And there was a fuck-up with the last recording because... Um, <laughs> Nick obviously he's been running his game and it's on it's an online game and for, for shits and giggles he put a robot effect on his voice he forgot to take the robot effect off so we went to so we're, we're doing this episode again now uh, but Nick obviously is well can we say he's an idiot well uh, we can say he's a robot so I'll say oh, that we know that that's yeah. been confirmed well that's confirmed but a stupid robot <laughs> bad programming well yeah, 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 go on yeah. then. I mean, you said it. I did not. Yes. <laughs> yes. Wow. So, for those not present at our usual courtly meetings, this is an RPG show all about tabletop RPGs, and you may now all be seated because today's feast includes feedback. It includes news punch, what you're slaying, and the main subject, which is going to be mega dungeons. Do they suck? And then we're going to do some electro lets. Does that sound good? Yeah. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. We're gonna. That's what we'll promise for this show. It's gonna be all right. And then if it's good, which it won't be, then it, it remains all right. Exactly. Yeah. Kind of like my lunch today. Shut up. <laughs> so going on about your lunch, we're not paying for it. It's, you know, it's later than lunch. I mean, it is. Late. Yeah, what time is it? It's fucking twenty past seven. What are you doing eating lunch? Well, I saved you my, piece of shit. Well, what I did is I saved my lunch for dinner and then ate lunch uh, out. Dinner. So, so, so I ate my dinner on the bus. So, <laughs> so like, sort of inconvenience. Are so you on? Have you, couple, have you been that, smoking crack? That's a couple of extra quid. Are you like, smoking it's, crack? It's a couple of extra <laughs> quid, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, because you ate your dinner on the bus. Yeah, it's sort of like you know inconvenience. <laughs> Just like that fart. That's another fifty p. Thanks, Jay. This has got to probably be the worst start to anyone we've ever it done. Is. But uh, <laughs> let's do some feedback. No. James, stop saying no to everything. It's like you're a two-year-old. I am a two-year-old. That's true. That's true. He's very. He's got a very deep voice. Anyway, feedback. The feedback side. The feedback side. Yes, bitch. The feedback side. It's the feedback section. Yeah, we take your comments and read them out. Yeah, feedback, bitch. So, um, yeah, the, the, uh, we have a Discord that I've just discovered has been going for three years. <laughs> and uh, the Huss man on our Discord, he says, for those of you that receive texts from at Harrison, here's a new notification sound courtesy of the most recent episode. And uh, yeah, so obviously I've done a fart and he's cut it out and put it on the Discord server. So, all right. So Chunks Magoo. Um, last episode, we did a, a um, episode about uh, evil PCs, how to deal with them, how to run a fun <laughs> evil campaign. <laughs> and uh, Chunks Magoo, he says, I find that having market stalls and busy shopping areas, he's missed off one of the P's. Chopin. And, and busy Chopin areas <laughs> stops this sort of behavior. But that... Having an instant recourse against it is trickier. He, 
he's another person that's been smoking crack by the sounds of it <laughs> there is an indoor market in my town that has existed for 600 years and it has security so it's pretty easy to imagine it always has some sort of guard 600 years oh no yeah. it's all right in the game wait I did this last time you did do I this I got really confused about the but now the listeners about. haven't missed out on that great banter <laughs> because I thought it was the, a campaign has been passed down for generation and generation wow so, oh. so, 600 years but um yeah, good point. I mean, Sean, you once ran a game where people fought to the death for a discount on a stick. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you're saying that like it's my fault. Well, I'm just saying that, that it had you put security guards in a 600-year-old area, maybe we would have ended up in a different position. You know what I mean? Uh, that's a fair point, but um, people will always just fight anyway. I mean... So, yes, I- but you put security there then they would have been less likely to. Yeah, I suppose. And also, it's like, I, I just don't get why PCs hate shopkeepers so much. And it's like, one of the techniques <laughs> I've I've employed of recent years is like, if they just go to some t- tiny small town, it's not really feasible that the shop would have security. But I've had it been like, like halfway through them bullying the shopkeeper, the shopkeeper's just like, why are you doing this? Like, oh, what, yeah. what what's wrong? What have I done to you? Like the thing is, it usually it usually diffuses the situation. And we go, um, oh yeah, so, oh sorry. yeah. Nobody would ever do this. <laughs> go, oh, sorry about that, mate. And we'll pay. We'll why, pay you for it. Why can't people just shop normally in in games? I I sort of trust people to do so, but. Now I'm going to have to sort of beef them up like GTA shopkeepers. Well, well, mm-hmm. it just doesn't happen because, like, in your campaign that you're currently running, I mean, we'll get to this, but there's been. Well, there's been a lot of... A a lot lot of of, crime. A lot of crime in our anti-crime squad. Yeah, and it's a bit weird because, like, I think you just set us up for it because you explained the situation and we're meant to be incognito about everything, so we're trying to sneak in there. Whereas um, other campaigns and say some that Harrison's run is just go, yeah, we're going to shop, buy stuff. Yeah, but then in this campaign, it's because we're tr- because we're mutant animals. Actually, we'll get to this in a bit, but we've stolen from a lot of shops, yeah. despite being the heroes. We're great. I don't think we've even... I've, I've had money and not paid for something I could afford. We have a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that is a good... Uh, that's a good That's a good way of doing it. If it's really fucking busy, chunks of goo, then, uh, yeah, the PCs are likely to get caught, and you can just say, well, there's hundreds of people around you're probably going to get caught. Mm. And then they'll probably just say, well, I'll try to sort of like blend in with the crowd and uh, then uh, steal the potion. <laughs> anyway, that is it for feedback. Thank you very much, the Hussman and Chunks Magoo. Uh, let's do some news, shall we? Yes. News. Punch. The headline is this: A fourth TSR appears. Good, it's good. Any more on the horizon? Uh, well, it's a couple more since. But anyway, the, you're gonna have to try to try to follow me here, guys, because this is like really fucking complicated. So right. we spoke last episode about the new TSR started by Ernie Gygax and mentioned Ernie's subsequent Twitter breakdowns. This TSR was the third TSR because there was one that came a decade after the original one to produce Gygax magazine. Now, TSR2 rebranded after Ernie's Twitter feuds with his brother and changed their name to Solarian Games. But now, TSR3, the one owned by owned by Gary Gygax's son, has also rebranded to distance themselves from their own public image and are now called Wonderfilled Inc., right? But interestingly, the company's name isn't isn't one is well, but interestingly, on the website, they've misspelled it, so it's Wonderfiled, Inc., <laughs> right? And bit... so they misspelled their own name on their own website. And funnily enough, Ernie Gygax is now trying to say that Wizards of the Coast were responsible for the backlash that he received on Twitter about TSR3. And he did speak publicly about gender politics, which, no matter what your views are, you really shouldn't do it in this uh, day and age when you're trying to run a business. Yep. Um, but he's blaming Wizards of the Coast. He's now saying that it was corporate espionage and that somebody was using his Twitter account against his will. 
But yeah, um, it's pretty mental. But anyway, the previous PR manager, a bloke called Stefan Deinhardt, um, was supposedly responsible for all of the TSR Twitter accounts, including Ernie Gygax's, and he's now stepped down, as we mentioned in the last episode. So now that TSR 3 has uh, has become one wonder-filed, or wonder-filled, <laughs> a fourth TSR has emerged. So, you see, in addition to TSR 3, Gygax Jr. also ran a shop out of the original office building that once housed the original TSR, this shop, called the Dungeon Hobby Shop Museum, is now owned by TSR4 and is run by our pal Ernie. So this is officially the fourth TSR ever. Oh, man. I kind of wish it was called TSR4. Well, that's what people are referring it to. it Because it's it's got nothing to do with the original TSR from the 70s. Mm. In addition to that, the one thing that Ernie Gygax had was this um, setting called Giant Lands. There was like a previously unpublished setting for D&D back in the 80s, right? He had that, but now all the people that own that, after he went mental, they've left the company and took Giant Lands with them. So the new TSR has nothing to do with the original 80s one, the second one, and technically not the third either. So, wow. But yeah, he claims that that PR guy was operating all the Twitter accounts and actually he's not anti-transgender and actually he loves people and he's a really great guy. But whether or not any of that's true, this has got to be the biggest, stupidest marketing campaign ever. Ernie Gygax sort of dug his own grave, really, by acting like a crazy person in the first place, I think, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, all, all they had to do, all they had to do was go, it's TSI's back, we're bringing back a return to form. And loads of people, it wouldn't have been the, the same been as easy. the D&D days. But yeah, it's easy. That's easy fucking money. Yeah. And he's just shat it up the wall. That's easy PR. We're yeah. back. Um, and if you're going to blame it on the PR guy as well, well, you're giving him the orders, so he's... You also gave him access to your Twitter account. It's exactly. like if it, if I gave my Twitter account, which I don't have, to Hitler, I'm not going to expect good results. Because <laughs> he, was, he was notoriously quite, you know... Shit at typing. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. So it would just be like... <laughs> But anyway, yeah, so the new TSR, TSR4, hopefully the last in the line of recent TSRs. It won't be. It won't. But, um, Ernie, I can't wait for the rest, though. <laughs> Me too. I want to put we should on, start I want... our own one, man. Yeah. <laughs> Do you reckon we can just jump the gun and go straight to nine? <laughs> yeah, just go, we're now TSR9. I'll change my name to Harrison Gygax. You can be Dave Arneson. And Sean, you'll just be Sean, right? Um, well, I could be Fat Man in the Shop. No, I just, I just be, I just be sure. It's quite, quite a weird thing to say. Quite, quite a fa- I, I don't know. Um, Unnamed NPC. Well, I'm selling. <laughs> yes, that's um, a, that would be actually a good name for like a ghost writer in the RPG scene. Unnamed NPC. But anyway, yeah. So they're probably not going to produce anything good. Only Gygax is a fucking idiot, and he squandered a good opportunity that you had there. And uh, there are too many TSRs out there. But nerds team up with Wizards of the Coast for a product nobody was asking for. Now I know what you're thinking. Nerds already teamed up with Wizards of the Coast ages ago, right? <laughs> but the funny thing about that is, is that it's nerds the candy. They've uh, they teamed up with D and D. Great, right. oh, wicked, good. What, what are they doing? You're actually excited about this. Are they doing I'm mud? Sure they doing mud flavored nerds or something? <laughs> <laughs> they, no, they should do um, fucking hero shaped nerds. So they're like massive and and bulky. Yeah, and they you use them as minis, and then when they're done, the DM just leans over the table and bites it. Is oh, mate, this is gonna suck. That could it? be real life um, damage. You'd be like, oh yeah, and his head came off. <laughs> or just smash it with a hammer. <laughs> uh, so, what's the verdict on nerds? The candy we. Is, uh, are we right. yes? Are we yes? Right. Uh, I'd say yes. Uh, um, although not yes for your teeth, but yes for the Bit overrated. Well, exactly. Uh, so basically, what this is, right, is that when you buy a pack of nerds, they're doing a special promotion, you'll get various codes which will unlock pre-made characters and adventures. So all the adventures are going to be for one player and a DM, right? And you get six of them. And once you've unlocked all six, you get the seventh adventure meant for all six characters once they've leveled up to level three. So then all of the people uh, come together for one big story. But the story revolves around a city called Harmony where colour is fading away and it's up to the heroes to revive it. Now, they did release a TV advert as well and I watched it, right? And um, it's, it? it's easy to say this is clearly for children. Mm. It, 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 um, it sounds like they've they've done a good job on corporate pandering, but it's still corporate pandering. Yeah. 
you you gonna need to speak up a bit. But that's I agree, right? And it's like the advert is fine, but it's a little bit patronising, like a little bit patronising. Well, of course it is because it's, it's aimed at kids and gonna be like, ooh, yeah, do this. It's literally like you are a wizard. You spend more time in spell books than you do the battlefield. But a worthy adversary you make against any orc. It's kind of like that. Oh, so it's someone who watched like five minutes of Lord of the Rings, like a marketing bloke or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I don't know. I hope it's a good way to get kids into the game. No, it's but, good for that. It but, won't be. But it's... one thing to bear in mind is that I doubt, A, I doubt any of them will actually play it because you will need to buy dice as well. And if you've got one pound pocket money to go and get a pack of nerds, then you have to buy a set of five pound dice on top of it. Probably yeah. never going to happen. And also, you need to have one GM who everyone can go to because otherwise, you're going to have six random people. Right. And if you're new to the game, we all know the GM is usually the person that introduces it to the group, right? Yeah. So if you get back and nerds and you like, want to play, yeah. well, you're shit out of luck, mate. I suppose you you have like your gang and stuff, so you could all pull in and buy like a pack of nerds <laughs> to get like you know. <laughs> Well, can you all play one character? Is that how you? <laughs> well, I mean, if you want to play it in the traditional sense, that is gonna that's gonna be what's gonna have to happen because it'll be you sitting around the table, everyone playing the same character, because usually you have you know a group of five. Nobody plays one on one RPGs in this. They're pretty fucking sad. <laughs> can we... <laughs> I don't know where that was going, but yeah. Anyway, yeah, nerds, D and D, both good things. Should they mix? It's up to you, listeners. Text us on 21438. All right, well, that is it for news. I mean, we were asking for some news for ages, saying that there was no news out there, and now we've got this shit. So that's good. Well, thanks. So thanks, world. There's more TSRs now, apparently, right? I'm not, you know, I, I haven't verified this fact, but I read on a website, news website, that apparently there are now more TSRs than people in the world. <laughs> uh, How much is this? 149, sir. I've got 50p. Fuck you, bastard. Say what you were going to say. Uh, I was going to say, like, uh, there has been, like, a new Savage Worlds sort of mod announced uh, called Dark States that looks quite good. Oh, yeah, we probably should, because the bloke who is making Dark States is... All right. He's all right. He's and good. No, no, he's paying for the Patreon. He's paying for our holiday to Barbados. He's great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he's the and, best. and Dark States, right? I don't know much about it, other than it's a modern horror investigation thing. But I will say right now, 10 out of 10. But if he stops paying, one. Thing is, though, cracking GM. So, and I know he's, he's a smart he's a smart pup. That's true. He is, he is a GM. I've actually played in his games at Savage Con, and he's fucking good. So, yeah, Dark States. Keep an eye out for that. Um, but Sean, don't ever jump into my news again. All right? <laughs> you stay the fuck out of my news. I'll jump into your news. It's so interesting, man. If you you know, I just want to. He wanted to be the fifth TSR. Yeah, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the next bit of news. New TSR emerges. Dark you, states. I've seen Sean's on his laptop. He's just fucking. Um, he's just, yeah. <laughs> TSR five limited. Shawnee Gagax. <laughs> <laughs> it's Gary's long lost son. All right. What? Well, uh, yes. Uh, you know. And if one of these! Oi! Yeah? What you slaying? What? <laughs> what do I know? Alright, let's do what we've been slaying. That's a good point. So we've been uh, we've been doing some Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Hero Beasts game. Is that fair to say? Uh this is a game. Yeah, yeah. Um the Mutant Hero Beasts is like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and I am running it. And these guys are beasts in, in a city, and they're trying to save the world and stuff. Uh, there's been a lot of terrorism in the city. Yeah, but we, to be fair, we had to do it. I mean, not you guys. Oh, right. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, you, you guys have committed uh, quite a fair amount of treason. But um, but we but, but here's the thing. The way this game is structured, essentially, is thus. We're mutant animals with kung fu type abilities living yep. in a sewer and we're trying to basically a school got attacked we figured out that the people who attacked the school had military weapons and we wanted to know where they got them from turns out they stole them and they've been working for this country, uh, company called Ultron which is headed up by a guy called Will Ferrell as in like a feral animal 
Yes. Which is both funny and... Funny. Exactly. So, I mean, that that high-quality humor... To be fair, Sean originally didn't want him to be called Will Ferrell. Um, I but, paid him two bennies for that. Yeah. yeah yes. And we changed it. And now he also talks like Will Ferrell does that really loud thing where he's just saying something but saying it in a loud way. That's funny, isn't it? Uh, no, it is not. And also, it's sort of like... Take Attention, my, people of California! It's sort of like the RPG equivalent of... You know when uh, you you have a custom set of clothes in a video game, <coughs> and then you go into an FMV and like you're wearing clown clothes in this really clown emotional, cl- sort of <laughs> really sort of emotional scene happening. Uh, yeah, but no, oh, because because it, any scene featuring but, Will Ferrell is in- inherently going to be bloody yeah, stupid and serious uh, but, <laughs> at the same time. Uh, as a mad scientist, I guess he works pretty well. To be fair, there you go. So um, yeah, we've we've tracked him down. We tracked him down. We kidnapped him. We brought him back to the lab, which was a lot of fun because we had to try and get into his house by yeah, going in in a ma- masquerade ball. Yes, yeah, it's it handy that that was happening. Um, and like. It, the funniest thing about this campaign that's like it constantly happens at every session is um, obviously Sean's painstakingly sort of put together pieces, printed off um, maps at a high quality print shop, paid money for all this stuff. And then we get to an encounter or something and Sean is, uh, will, will spend like a good actual minute or two setting it up and, you know, at the table, that's fairly long. Um <laughs> And then we just um, dispatched the situation but, but incredibly fast. I will say this. Yeah, you guys. We, we have been, like, bringing our A game every week in terms of plans. We, the reason being is because we know Sean's yeah, a killer Sean, DM. It's Sean's game. He That's tries why. to kill people. I don't try and kill people. I have My difficulty in my games is perfect. Uh, <laughs> I, will, I, I will advertise Modest. my games... Uh, right now, no. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know whether I'm running a good game, but at least the yes, difficult- you do. We always say it's good, you fool. Uh, yeah, it well, is good. It is know. good, but you, you sort, of, you, you created this, right? This atmosphere of like, we want to fuck you over, all right? You, you, you did it to us. You notoriously so. Sean's like the only um, GM that we've had TPKs on, and so yeah. we know that we have to be careful. And the thing is, it's like one of the first guns that they brought out in the campaign at the school was a shotgun one Which of the most like, powerful weapons in savage world that's like the character killer straight off the bat and then we're then we're fighting mooses and shit like this the, the way the campaign's sort of going right is it's kind of like we we expect the worst so we over prepare for things and that's how yeah. it's been like so it'll kind of be like with the masquerade ball for example it, we can't leave loose ends so when I got caught by the security guards where well, they just had to die do you know what I mean because <laughs> uh, otherwise Sean's going to be like yeah an army comes to the base but funny enough after we captured Will Ferrell an army came to the base so um, well, yeah, do you want to do you want to explain yourself there mate well actually do you want to explain yourself right fuck, fuck you, you man do you both want to explain yourselves uh, basically because uh, you called uh, they basically found out uh, from the scientist Will Ferrell that uh, he was being controlled by the Shredder, who was defeated in 1987. Why are you talking like this? It's not like <laughs> a, actually an episode who was defeated by the Shredder. Just who was defeated? Well into it. <laughs> I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm just right, like... So, so uh, uh, shut up, shut it, shut up. Listeners. Stop. It's good, it. it's good now. podcasting. So, uh, no, it isn't. Um, just talk like a human might. Okay. If right. you can imagine such a thing. Right, so, basically, we found... Oh, so, shut so, up, so, so, oh, so Sean. I am going to... <laughs> I am going to kill you in real life. You told me, you told me to talk. Yeah, when you are after you allowed to speak. So we found out that Shredder was mind controlling this fucker into doing all of this bad stuff, and uh, Shredder sort of, uh, well, we we called him up. I mean, we asked Will for Will Ferrell for his number, and we called Shredder up and pretended to be from the gas company. And it just so happens that the army tries to call back. So we tra- we traced him, and they traced us right the fuck back. Yeah. So a hundred foot soldiers came into the fu- our fucking a hundred. Sewer base. This is the second base. A hundred. This is the second base that we've got, and we've gone through now. We get to u- we used it one session, and one you know, and a half session. And you know, bear in mind, nice right? Bear well. in mind, it was a sure. fucking train unused train station. It was perfect. Most GMs, right? They probably <laughs> have one or two TPKs their entire career. Ha! Sean. 
I think you've had it's definitely double digits. I know that. Uh, in in camp in campaign terms, I don't think I've had many though. I think uh, when you guys decide in the two campaigns that you run for our group, besides this one, we TPK'd twice. Three times total. Oh, wait, yeah. With the exclusion of the end of your Fallout one, where my guy managed to get away, but it was essentially a TBK. Oh, well, when you, lo- when you decided to take on the police, is that what you mean? Yeah, now he's trying to paint it like it was our fault. <laughs> and, and, and listen, we're sitting in our base, 100 guys come in. So, I mean, what the fuck is that all about? Uh, the thing that I think is funny, and, and the reason why we plan so much, is because we know, firstly, <clears throat> Sean doesn't pull his punches. Mm. And secondly... He he literally is the, the the least fudger ever. So he just rolls with the dice. At least like in I some cases. No, but we've spoken about it before where it's just like uh, at at a certain situation when you realise oh shit this is too bad, you'll just be like you'll manoeuvre the situation so that the players have an idea of how deadly it is. Therefore, yeah, like I might do decision. They'll be like, oh yeah, we should probably run something away. like that. Like, like maybe one of your NPCs gets killed, and I describe how gruesome it was. Or maybe I call for a morale check a bit earlier for the monsters. Whatever, like some there's like little buffers. But it was a hundred guys come in, right? And what was, uh, well, let's call it what it is. It was it was funny. Is Sean was trying to toss up like a way of quickly rolling a hundred attacks. And I mentioned, I was like, just roll a D100. That gives each person the potential to do one damage, right? I think that was fair. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good idea. So it does it. 87. What? Uh, Ryan's character hits the, hits the fucking deck. This character called Bear Grylls, who's a bear rapper. Um, he goes down uh, 87 damage. He's on 25 wounds or something like this, right? Because we're using Savage Worlds. Another quirk of Savage Worlds, at least modern Savage Worlds, is that you can spend a penny to influence the story, right? <laughs> so immediately we're like, 87 wounds, he's fucking down, he's fucking dying. There's no way he's coming back from that. So one of the other characters at the table goes, right, can I just spend a penny to see if the sewer starts falling apart with all of these guys in there and all the explosions going off and maybe then they can just re-roll damage, right? So he spends a penny to get Sean to re-roll damage. Um, and what, what was it? No, no, it was not to re-roll damage. It was to he rolled to see how many of them died in the crash, sort of taking damage uh. away from the 87, right? He spends the penny, rolls a D100, 100. Just, what? I know. He gets it straight on, and all of us were going crazy because it's like every one of them died. So you influence the story. I I, I missed the session. You influence the story to see who who out of the army got crushed before they piled in on you guys. Yes, because the, of the explosions, there would have been debris. Also, yeah. debris. also, uh, there was a very high risk of you guys getting crushed as well. There you go. But they every that's amazing. I oh, know it was. That's it, fucking. That is this is quite like success so, territory. That there's a bit of a meme at our table where I constantly try to urge people to make really risky rolls that are probably not going to happen. Because if they do it, they're a fucking legend. Yeah. So that started with Gen Lab, and it would be like if I I'd say to somebody, push the roll, and they'd be like, but I've only got one dice with which to roll, and I'd be like. Yeah, but you know, if you get this, you'll be a fucking legend. <laughs> so I put it on our Facebook group. The guy that rolled that hundred, he's officially a fucking legend. Can we yes. say that? So yeah, that was it. Was pretty fucking amazing. I can't remember what fucking happened after that, but it was. Uh, it, too, it doesn't it, fucking it too matter. Up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can't remember. I can't. You remember. can't remember your own campaign. Um, no, no you wrote up earlier. No, no. You, you, yeah, you were, you were just saying I can't. Remember. Oh no, I remember what fucking happened. So anyway, after the foot soldiers all died with the hundred, we get out and we're going over to Shredder's gaff. And uh, so we've we've started, but we're building bombs and stealing a plane, and we're going over to the oh, techno mate, drone. This sounds great. So that's why we left the game, James. You weren't at that one. But uh, sadly, a, a terrible thing happened. So oh, no. James is playing this character. He's a scoter, surf scoter, which is a type of duck. And so oh, he made no. a surfer character do. It's good, man. And um, on our downtime, where we were supposed to be preparing for a mission, James just went to the beach and found a pet crab. Yeah, and- I went surfing. And then on my way back, I saw a crab. And then I, n- I named him Richard Wave. Yeah. Oh, I Dick Wave! R.I.P. Richard Wave. Yeah, we were in a fight because when we got back to our base, right, from doing the previous mission, capturing Will Ferrell, we found the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 
fucking with our our dad, right? Because we've all got the same dad. He's a raccoon. Don't ask. But um, we killed two of them. Two of them got away. And I tried to do... There's a thing in Savage Worlds called an agility trick where you can lower somebody's parry by, you know, throwing dirt at them, whatever. And for the first time, I was controlling your character, James. <laughs> I got out fucking dick wave. And I was just... Uh, I held him in my hand. and was like, you got to do this for me, bro. Go and get him. I throw him. Crit fail. Sean's like, you throw the crab into the side of a train... And then um, no, and he and he and he dies immediately. You know, no. And then it was funny because one of the other characters went. Um, no, one of the other characters was like, oh, "Don't don't worry about it, man. We can get that. We can get that fixed. We'll stuff him for you." And Sean was like, "No, there is no stuffing him. He has become a basically a red cloud of crab meat." Oh no, mate! I'm so sad. We'll get you another one. I'm real life sad. But yeah, I didn't control your character outside of battles. It was just to help us in the battle. And then the one thing he did, I killed your pet while you were away. (laughs) So Harrison, you're terrible. I am deeply, deeply soz. Your dice skills. And lost the use of his leg. Sorry. Yeah, Uh, but uh, that is it for what? What? No, not really. It was only one leg. Um, All right, so. <laughs> that is what we've been playing. We've been playing Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I think we're coming close to the end, right? Because I feel like it's we've we, we've basically got James. We we've got like truckloads of fertilizer and sodium oh. nitrate and things like this because we're going to make a bomb and uh, hopefully drop it on the tech. Surely, drone. just the truck, right? Well, uh, I, is the bomb? I don't know. Well, that is it's going to be something like that. We're thinking of either putting the truck in there or we're going to go and steal an airplane. Uh, I don't know if you remember the the size. Of of the Technodrome from yes, yeah, so I do remember how big it was, right? But bear in mind, I have bought what is it? I can't remember the amount, but something like two thousand kilos of fertilizer. Okay, if That's you've good. ever seen That's a good. fertilizer explosion, I have. Yeah, yeah, a couple. But um, yeah, like, be scared. I'm gonna have to do some. <laughs> Be scared. This is, of this is what it comes down to. In I'm Sean's scared. Campaign. I'm scared because I'm gonna have to do a lot of maths now. Yeah, Just bring calculator, bro. Yeah, I'm, g- I'm gonna. I've got my phone. They said we wouldn't have calculators. Now look at us. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. In all the tests when you were kids, and you're like, no, you won't be walking around with the calculator, so you have to do the non. Actually, mate, fuck I off. I think you'll find. <laughs> I think you'll find. My calculatrice is always at the ready. So, um, just another little addition. You, you listeners who um, sort of have been listening for a long time might remember that we went round to a mate's house once and played a one shot and he had like a, a, a bell that you would use in a shop like yes. ding you do it whenever you get critted uh, or get got a crit I should say um, James and I unfortunately the games have been a bit rowdy haven't they I mean we've it's all been getting we, drunk um, and we're, we're trying yeah. to fuck Sean over and I, like- I think it's because um, <laughs> it's, it's because it's Sean's campaign and it's deadly we're always like we're all quite a bit hype about it because we know it's, we're in for like um, a tough a tough time but and when we get victory we have time. to earn it right yeah you know? and every 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 smidge of victory actually is so sweet and nice that we get too carried away so oh, james and i were sitting next to each other shut up actually sorry um so well no it is good but yeah james and i were sitting next to each other and we downloaded some some meme sound boards <laughs> that we were using for whenever people did a crit <laughs> but the unfortunate thing is the urge to, to, to sort of do it constantly took me over and yeah. it was just throughout that and this is like the main one that's been used a lot get wrecked um, that's come out a lot and uh, there's also <laughs> Sean looks so depressed but the worst thing was is it the last game like the one before the one that just happened I was constantly doing it and I could see people getting annoyed but I still did it because the urge because it was like that urge to sort of be a bit bit cheeky bit naughty it's was always there re- really Larry yeah like so for the rest of the podcast I'm going to be sort of busting these out every so often one equals two two has three letters a triangle has three sides math equals Illuminati confirmed <laughs> so that is the sort of high level of humour that's happening at the so game. I have to sort of father children. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It was so funny though because um, the other day I was like, no, 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 I, pr- I promise, I promise, I won't use it excessively. And then I just had it next to me, and the temptation was huge, but I did resist, didn't I? No, that was. Good. And when people, when people actually did crit, so I was pressing the get wrecked. Did, but how many times did you press it? Oh, loads, obviously. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it all yeah, out yeah. there. There's a couple of random air horns, but you did a good job of 
Oh, that's um, mean. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so that is that. But anyway, uh, I've recently, uh, well, we've been doing some gets for the podcast, right? Uh, actual play-wise, to be perfectly honest, I don't know what's fucking happening at the moment because there's one sort of third of the actual play, uh, you know, there isn't, you know. But anyway, we've been buying some stuff for our future actual play. So DCC, Goodman Games, they've just done... Uh, a Kickstarter for Dying Earth, which is their big new setting, and it's going to have four new character classes. And oh it's, yes, yeah, and there's um, yeah, so there's there's like one that's a, uh, I, I think it's either you play as a fluid, uh, a vat of fluid, or you play as something living in a vat of fluid. Wait, is either this, way, is this like? Sounds pretty awesome. Sorry, man, Carry it on. does sound wicked. Because uh, is this like a uh, post-apocalyptic for DCC, or is this like a modern post-apocalyptic type thing? So it's a post-apocalyptic game, sort of. So what it is is that it's a fantasy universe with a bit of science in it too, where the moon has just you know f- has gone and fucked off, and the sun is like blinking out like a like a fucking light blinking out you know when you've got like a dodgy bulb yeah so this guy wrote these novels and it's based on those but the reason it's kind of like a, well an important set of novels is because the whole system of magic that D uses comes from the dying earth novels so essentially you know how you in D you memorize a spell in the morning once you use it it's gone from your brain and then the next day you have to wake up and re-scribe them in your book to remember them for that day right? yes that that essentially is how it works in Dying Earth. So it's kind of cool that they're, they're doing that crossover. But yeah, four new classes should be fucking good. And we're hopefully going to do an actual play of that in the future. And in addition to that, we also kick-started uh, Astonishing Swordsmen and Sorcerers of Hyperborea. Yes. Third edition. So, um, yeah, this is like a... Uh, you know, like these the sort of like Conan comic books and things like this. Mm. It's kind of like a mod for AD&D... But it's got 21 classes, I think, and it's a very comic book fantasy type thing set on a, f- a flat earth. So confirmed, flat earth confirmed. <laughs> but yeah, it should be should be fucking good. Uh, that's that's about all I know about it. But we ha- um, essentially James came up with a fucking cracking idea for an actual play using that system. So we're gonna do that. <laughs> yes. Wait. So um, here's a question for you: Has anyone seen the Earth, like the round Earth? I, I knew, I knew, like, I had a suspicion, Sean, that you were a flat earther. Because, see, no, because you, you, because, so lowly, right, yeah. I'm not, I'm, what, this next sentence Terrible. I'm about to say is a joke and is not true at all. But I know you enjoy a hip hop cigarette. Um, I do, yeah. Right. That part was a joke and that's not true. But, so why is it that weed people are so into cons- I've put my notes on the floor. Why do they love conspiracy? You believe all of it. <laughs> I don't believe all of it, no. You do, you no, like that? Uh, Jet fuel couldn't melt steel, but steel beams. Do you believe that one? I mean, I couldn't. Right. <laughs> They're turning the frogs gay. Um, what about that one? Well, I mean, that was, I mean, you know, Alex Jones, he's a bit, you know... He's... Yeah, but you believe a lot of what he says. I don't... No... Wow, hesitation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just think, what? I just, no. He, you, bear in mind, Alex Jones is, is from the uh, on quote unquote news site where he said that uh, chemical weapons are turning frogs gay, and also that. Uh, well, I don't even know what the context was, but there's that clip of him going, um, "I want, I want to go in with a goblin guide, and I hope he's not kissing his goblin wife." <laughs> uh, well, I mean, you like this man's stuff. I don't really watch Alex Jones, but um, like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, you, Sean, I'm not really a conspiracy guy. But yes, like, you, yes, you are. He's like, not really one, but he I like, I like conspiracies and stuff. Mm. I mean, do you remember when you thought that you'd found uh, evidence of alien life on Google Earth? Wait, um, no, wait, I didn't. No, I found area. I looked f- for area. I found f- it. I looked, He's the finder. I looked for area fifty-one on Google Earth, and I, I found it, but it was blocked out. So that's what's got me going on this whole conspiracy train. There was know? a point where basically, basically, Sean was looking at farms on Google Earth, and you know they have grain silos that are circular. Yeah. He's like. That's where the fucking UFOs are, like, and he, you meant it. Like, Sean looks really embarrassed right now because it's fucking true. Oh, good. Um, oh, this is good. It's not. It's terrible. But, um, but flat, yeah, flat, I don't believe in all conspiracies. But some of them. You I, believe in more some of the stupider ones. Uh, some no, some of the good ones. You used to. <laughs> 
Do you remember oh. when you were, when I was we were talking about David Icke and I was like, he's a nutter, isn't he? Somebody that believes that the highest powers in society are all lizards, and you're like, but he has got a point. Well, no, he's he's. Uh, oh way, my god, the, the way Sean Hunt. The, the way he talks is cool, like um, like and he's a good writer, but like I don't believe that. The he's royal, a madman. I don't believe that royal, the royal family are lizards or anything, but you know, there's something going on there. You know, look at Prince Philip. He's like, he's like, where he was wearing that skin. Is it too soon to make Prince Philip? Jokes? Actually, do you know what? Do you know what? When Tony Blair was prime minister, Sean. Oh my God, this is this is the best. I'm so glad we brought you on here, man, because this is great. Thank you. I'm loving this. We'll get back to RPGs in a second, but. I remember when um, Tony Blair was prime minister, and Sean was like, "Well, look up, look at him when he's on a podium, right? Always sweating. Why is he so sweaty? It's the middle of winter. I mean, it couldn't be the stage lights. It's because he's a lizard wearing human skin." Uh, did he actually say that? He, he actually thought Sean, that. Sean, did you actually say that? Well, I mean, like, I didn't mean. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean like. I didn't, I'm confirmed I didn't, it. I didn't, Illuminati confirmed. I didn't mean like. like <laughs> I didn't mean right. like lizard or anything. Like, I meant like you Me know. Sorry. I mean, there's something going on in it. You he, thought no? I think you thought he was an alien. He looked. He looked a bit like an alien, though. <laughs> like, a lot of people look a bit. James looks a bit like an alien. Fucking yeah. Oh yeah, you do. Oh. <laughs> Is that your alien impression? You, you, well, it's because it wasn't. You can't. All, you can't. <laughs> But you can't you audibly see my face, so I had to make yeah, a you noise. Don't look oh. like a, like, you don't look like some weird slender man, like some ghoul from Fallout, innit? You, you, right. Your head's got... This is it, but why is it every time we have you on, there's a bit where it gets like really... Like, Sean was talking last time he was on about horses for about 20 minutes, like conspiracy theories about horses. And now... Yeah, cut it all out. So yes, Sean, uh, just to summarise, uh, Alien, Tony Blair, Flat lizard. Earth, Lizard People... And still be Illuminati exists. Uh, yes, actually. Right. Um, Thank you. you <laughs> that's uh, right. That's that was Sean's conspiracy corner. Oh, wait, but no, you, I did have an idea for an episode though. You should do Illuminati: The Game by Steve Jackson. Yeah, but it's a board game, Sean. I mean, but it's still Steve Jackson games. But it did also get mentioned in the uh, one we did about Steve Jackson games. Oh, this I is meant- more of a sort of like a production meeting. Okay. Uh, what this will we turn this into a production meet? No, I'm saying this is for <laughs> <laughs> right. You're an idiot. We're gonna go into the main subject now, right? Sorry about all that conspiracy chat, but Sean basically believes anything he reads on the internet. Yep, yeah. so, yeah. good lad. Good main subject ma- ma- magic, main subject Tokyo, main subject. So, Mega Dungeons, sprawling multi-level level labyrinths that take months and months of gameplay to explore. I know what you're thinking, sounds like a lot of fun, I hear you say. Well, there is a distinct possibility that you might be wrong. While video games like Dark Souls or Metroid treat us to the exploration of huge dungeons with ex- expert background storytelling and themes communicated via imagery and en- environments, this is a practice often difficult to get right in the RPG world. Because in a video game, people tend to be more primed to engage with the environment in ways other than fighting, while RPGs tend to need a bit more spelling out to players, so dungeons often feature, you know, old paintings or carvings to get across the point of it, rather than doing it organically. So, and that's all well and good, you know, for a one-shot, or even one that takes ten sessions, and it's not an unreasonable task to ask of any RPG producer to, you know, chuck in a bit of scribblings or some bit of doodles on the wall, you know what I mean? But for them to sprinkle in an interesting story when it's when the dungeon is scaled up to an unbelievably stupid size, do the ideas of story-rich dungeons become too watered down, spread too thin? Well, it's possible, lads, and we're going to investigate this today by looking at some of the most popular examples of the Mega Dungeon format, Illuminati, and we'll also dive a little bit into the history of the genre and see how we got to the place we're at now with Mega Dungeons. Does that sound like fun? Say yes. I can't contain my excitement. James. I mean, I can contain it. Please do. In a really well... well You're doing well. You're doing well. I mean, James looks like he's bored. But inside, <laughs> inside, I'm containing my excitement. So, Sean, are you excited? Yeah, yeah, I'd say I'm excited. On a scale of one to fifteen, uh, sixteen. Mate. You've made a mockery of that scale. <laughs> uh, That's how excited. I mean, is. I made a mockery of this show already. So. You have, you have. But the thing is, this I've got so much dirt on you. That's the trouble. <laughs> that's that's the fucking trouble. Um, yeah. Look, yeah, let's just say, let's out. just say. 
if you can dig out the book you wrote about street losing, I, I, we'll review it on this show. Okay. I'll, Have you got it? I, I've got it, yeah. Oh, yes! yes! Oh, that would be good to read. Can we read it? But actually, uh, it sort of got replaced with the lyrics you guys wrote. and I wrote Which I to... stole mainly from Linkin Park. Yeah. Anyway, Mega Dungeons. What are they? As the name suggests, they're huge, sprawling underground labyrinths that the PCs explore in search of treasure, jewels, ghouls, goblins, and ghasts. Often featuring several levels, they are massive. And as such, they aren't really supposed to be explored in one go. <coughs> Usually, what PCs do is explore as much as they can before they reach breaking point or run out of resources, then go back to a nearby town to recoup and do downtime shit. So, when D&D first became a thing in the late 70s, Dave Arneson and Gary Gygax, the game's creators, were both running Mega, st- mega Dungeon-style games. And these took place over like many, many months of play. And as such, when the team demoed the game at cons... They would run shorter modules designed to be super difficult and have a winner, in air quotes. And that's where we get tournament modules from. That's how that came about. Because they were running these big fucking labyrinth games, and at fucking conventions, that just wasn't the done thing. So they just... It's not sure... uh, Because obviously, I've never sort of done anything like that. I don't know if any of us have. We we played it. I've run one tournament module for you guys. uh, The Carnival of Doom Death. Uh. The Death Con. Yes, actually, that was awesome. But that's I was going to say I didn't, I've never really dipped my toes in it, but I have. It's quite, it's quite a fun, uh, fun thing to do. There was a great um, episode of the Spellburn podcast all about tournaments. Um, but yeah, that's how they came about, basically. And at first, these types of tournament modules were the only kinds of adventures that TSR actually published because, to quote Gygax, talking about his Greyhawk Mega Dungeon campaign, he says, If we handed over the binders containing the maps and notes, I don't think even the ableist of DMs would be able to feel empowered to direct adventures using the module. (laughs) So uh, it wasn't until 1990 that we saw the first Mega Dungeon, Greyhawk Ruins. And the funny thing is, this wasn't the Great Hawk Ruins that Gary had uh, had had thought up. He actually left the company five years prior and took all of his campaign notes with him. So the first ever Mega Dungeon was actually pieced together from memories of the people that played in the original, but they had actually very li- little similarity. Seven months later, though, we would see perhaps the most iconic Mega Dungeon ever made, the Ruins of Under Mountain. So, they're such good names. They are good names. I, I, I like that one. And the Temple of Elemental Evil is such a good fucking name oh, as well. Is, yeah, that's actually a really good game as well. Yeah, it is. And yeah. uh, it's, it's a very good game. And uh, yeah, they, the names of things used to be so evocative. But DCC is still doing that. I guess with things like Moon Slaves of the Cannibal Kingdom, like that's pretty fucking good. It is. But yeah, so set in the for- Forgotten Realms campaign setting, this huge, ludicrously big dungeon was pretty legendary. It's so fucking big that it's often referred to in the text as a never-ending labyrinth, which is <laughs> probably why a commonly held opinion that it was actually uh, designed never to be finished is kind of like... like That's a widely accepted thing about Undermountain. Now, James, you've seen the map. The, or the maps. Well, all right. So, firstly, you know, it's, it could be... I thought um, it was a bit of a joke, to be honest, when I didn't realise what it actually was. Because I just thought, oh... That's like, you know when someone does a doodle on um, some grid paper and then you just like, you're just tracing the squares but then every now and then not making a whole square. I thought it was like that, but a really big version. It it, it does look like that. Um, and Sean, they're ridiculous. They're like, well, I mean, this is a terrible thing to do on radio, but see those frames behind me, behind you? It's like that size. So if you can imagine that, listeners, that's how fucking big it is. Okay, <laughs> uh, that is an A2 size. For a yeah, and, yeah, and it's the, the tiny little grid paper you tend to use for drawing dungeons out. So it's insanely big, right? And uh, yeah, the, the fact that it was designed to never be finished was further evidenced by the fact that only four of the nine levels of the dungeon were included within the original box set. And in fact, the book says that the box set is an introduction to the uppermost levels of Munda Mountain. Introduction? And uh, that's 160 pages of dungeon, mate. <laughs> 160 pages of just dungeon rooms, each the size of those frames over there. I mean, Christ almighty. 
Four gigantic maps and eight, eight pages of new monsters are also sort of included as well. So it's, quite, it's a pretty, pretty big introduction. It's a pretty chunky it's introduction. A good, it's a good book, though. It's a really good book. Like, that's a whole world right there. Value for money. you got you got brand well, new, never-before-seen <laughs> monsters in there. Only eight, though. Eight pages. I mean, come <laughs> only on. Eight. Only eight, <laughs> eight, eight, pages. eight monsters. <laughs> eight monsters. Oh, no. But that, that is good. I mean... Well, I mean, it seems like value for money, doesn't it? But the, yeah, but for, for what it's meant to... What you're meant to do with it, which is the same um, the same type of gameplay constantly. Look, we're going to review it now, fine. right? That's I'll get I'll get I'll get into it because we need to know if Under Mountain is actually any fucking good because nobody's ever finished it. Few people have ever fucking played it. So is so it? So it's not one of those things where they say it's the unfinishable game and it's actually finishable. Then. I don't know if anyone's ever... Definitely nobody's finished it, right? Because okay. it, only the four levels are available. So even if people have finished the published stuff, it's highly likely that the DM didn't then go on to plan uh, like a similar size thing for the next five fucking levels because they would be dead long before they got to do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, essentially the story behind the whole thing, right, is there's this mage called Halaster that got fed up of society and recruited a bunch of apprentices to help him build a new castle in the side of Mount Waterdeep. And each apprentice was tasked with making a different part. Now, I know what you're thinking. So each of the wizards built one level and the last two are maybe Halisters or something like that. But no, not really. At some point during the building of his lair, right, Halister went missing and it turns out he'd gone completely mental, hired a bunch of deep dwarves to build a huge underground death trap so that he could keep prying eyes away from his stuff and his research and all of that shit. Now, obviously, the seven apprentices were pissed because their paychecks stopped coming in. So they went down down into these ruins to search for their boss and then two of them died and Halaster actually wasn't happy with his fucking result right because if if his dungeon was built well all of them should have died right yeah so instead of fucking off right out of there and leaving the apprentices for some reason agreed to help Halaster in making the dungeon even harder than it was before completely forgetting that Halaster just you know punked two of their mates <laughs> Now, one of the apprentices, probably the only one with a brain, uh, didn't agree to help and instead fucked off and wrote a book about Halaster and how mental it was working for him. Uh, give me a second. Oh, sorry, I, th I thought I fucked it. Yeah, so, so they, uh, where is it, the book? Uh, oh, yeah. And in that book became a New York bestseller and as such, the hunt for Halaster's treasure was on. The name of the escaped apprentice was Jasira Castleharp. And she obviously only saw the beta test for the dungeon, right? The one where two people died, not the final release. Yeah. Because she escaped before the remaining apprentices set to work on it. So the book she wrote, well, you know, a cracking read, a uh, real page turner, was basically useless, other than the fact it brought attention to the entrance of the upper levels of Undermountain. It, it brought attention to the intro to the Undermountain. <laughs> A good attention to the intro of the intro. Yeah, and it was it was a nine hundred page book included, and and it was called everything you need to know about the introduction to the entrance of the dungeon. <laughs> I don't know that for sure. I might have misremembered that. So yeah, um, the story of this is bloody stupid, but it's essentially an excuse for going and getting treasure and exploring mines. And I'm trying to at least because yeah. you want to get the treasure. If you want to get to the end, well, it's not happening. If you want to get the treasure, probably not happening either because mm. it's a fucking death tram. So yeah, the story is uh, is a bit uh, is a bit naff, but uh, it's a bit rubbish, I think. I mean, why didn't he just go and kill them? I mean, you know, go and kill who? I mean, why did he have to make a dungeon? Uh, and well, he's not going to fucking go around the world seeking everyone that might be after his riches and killing them. I mean, that's what he wanted to do, isn't it? I mean, well, not but, really. He just thought if anyone comes to take my treasure, he is thousands upon thousands of traps for miles below ground yeah i mean but it, it sets up the game so you know. so it's, it sets up the game it's not exactly a good premise but the whole thing about mega dungeons is you're supposed to go back to the town to rest and that's where you do downtime and that's where the story is it's more about your character's development outside the dungeon the dungeon is just what he does for a job basically yeah. um but there are like mini stories within the Undermountain, right? See, there's one staple of this type of adventure is like the rumours table. So while you guys are at the pub, you can roll a d20 and get one rumour a day. And these can either be related to factions that live in the dungeon, specific treasures that can be uncovered, shit like that. So 
that is kind of the basis for the adventures down the dungeon. Somebody might say, somewhere on the first level, there's a big old fuck, fuck off ruby, or something like this, you see? And if you're using this as a setting, rather than conquering each level of the dungeon, which would be near impossible, maybe you just hear a rumour about the mad wizard that lives in the dungeon, and your goal is to find him. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So you're not going, you don't, you're not ticking off every fucking room. But there's one uh, that I quite liked, there's a thieves guild, right? And they went to, uh, they, they were so annoyed... Right, the, 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 uh, about a uh, s- sentencing of a crime that they got, that they uh, went down under mountain and live there now, which I can't imagine that is much nicer than prison. Well, why would they do that? I don't know, but it's kind of funny. Um, yeah, there's another one as well that the water deep government are offering gold for the destruction of evil temples found in the dungeons. So your mission might be going in looking for them and taking them out. And all of these things just serve to add context to the overall thing, but and give you a purpose. Because otherwise, it's just a meaningless acquisition of treasure. And actually, despite the stupid premise, these little hooks individually are okay-ish. And enough for a four-session game or something like that. And to my absolute surprise, right, the dungeon itself isn't terrible. The map is so utterly massive it's basically a joke. But really what this book is, is several smaller dungeon adventures linked into one giant theme. Now mm. obviously get, they get really, really fucking samey, but the book cordons off each section of the Undermountains into their own safe, self-contained thing. So it's you can just snip out parts to use. If you ever need a quick, dirty dungeon for your night of gaming, pick a page. There it is. Dirty like dungeon. Sorry. Dirty dungeon. Dirty dungeon. If you were to come down my dirty dungeon, um, so yeah, you you can just snip out parts, and because of uh, and, and the bad guys in the whole thing, right? The monsters themselves, they basically have no reason for being there, not none. Right? Well, of course the, they don't. The excuse for it, right, is that uh, Halister just gates them in from other dimensions. Yeah, so... Uh. So that means that you could ha- have a goblin and a giant spider casually sharing, sharing the same room and a green dragon and a beholder in the same yeah. room. Yeah, you could have a dragon in there that conceivably never would have been able to find its way to that point in the dungeon. Or fit in the room, fit yeah. in through the door to the yeah. room. Like, it's that type of thing. So it's just basically a shit excuse to have any monster they wanted where you're playing a hack and slash campaign. So, you know, that was uh, that was Undermountain. What do you guys think of it? I like the idea of using it not as it was originally intended. Mm-hmm. More so than how just, it was meant Just to taking be. out layouts for yeah. dungeons. I, yeah. like, I, I like the potential that you could have the dungeons as a bit of artwork. Um, yeah. I yeah, because you, yeah, you could just photocopy the page and then there you go, you've yeah. got it all done. You could yeah. do, be one of those really, really long mazes where you have to solve. Yeah, it just doesn't sound that fun though. No. Well, it doesn't uh, really sound like they've done anything to make the rooms interesting. Um, it sounds like you're, you're going to be just going into rooms, from room to room, killing monsters and shit. Yeah, that, it's, just, it's just the same thing over and over again. That is essentially it. Um, but the one thing I can say is that the encounters are varied. Even if they don't make a lot of sense, they are varied. Although it does raise the question why Halaster didn't just, if he can open casually open portals to other dimensions, why didn't he just hide his treasure in another dimension? Yeah, because he's an idiot. Because then someone from another dimension will steal it. Um, so he yeah. keeps it in his dimension, in his domain. So anyway... While the Greyhawk adventure was this first mega dungeon, Undermountain basically became the standard for published mega dungeons, for better or for worse, mainly worse. And from this point on, 90% of these types of adventures would include dungeons with one overarching theme, little story behind the actual fucking thing, and would include rumor tables, a mini setting in the form of the surrounding area, and a couple of new monsters. Undermountain had set the standard, and from here, it very rarely evolved beyond this, which brings me nicely to the barrow maze now i don't know about you guys but it's very hot in this room so we'll get to the next set it's next dungeon after we've gone for a break yeah all right Jeez. all right see, see you in a minute guys goodbye Hi, D. Glenn. good morning Glenn. <laughs> yeah so uh barrow maze right i know what you're thinking it's not delicious italian sauce often put over pasta <laughs> you know like spaghetti barrow maze <laughs> um but why is that funny <laughs> it's not it's not, it's not. um but yeah, this the Barrow Maze, right? This is often talked about as the shining example of the genre of mega dungeons. And let me say this, guys, it really fucking isn't. 
We, <laughs> it's no, fucking wait, we rubbish. Did, we did Baron Maze, actually, didn't we? Well, we did part of it. We used the setting a little bit. It, and was, a, it was a lot of fun, but you, you heavily sort of put your own I'm, stuff into I had it. to mod the fuck out of it, and you you'll see like, why. You, you was like, uh, well, we'll go. you go in and you can plunder one certain part of it each time, wasn't it? Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. you made it um, much easier to manage for the players. But and I also changed a lot of the content of the dungeons, and oh, yes. you guys will definitely see why. So the story behind Spaghetti Baramaze is <laughs> there's this god called Nurgle, right? And he realised one day that his sons Orcus and Set were going to fuck him up and steal his most powerful relic called the Tablet of Chaos. And I mean tablet as in a stone tablet, not like a paracetamol. Um, funny ha, joke. Ha, ha, <laughs> ha. <laughs> <laughs> And basically, if his sons get it, they'll be able to take his throne as the god of evil. Now, the thing is, right, Nurgle is mad scared, right? So he buries the fucking thing deep underground, commands the des- the dead. He commands a bloke called Dez to... Uh, <laughs> to command the dead. And then Dez gets the dead to rise and protect the Tablet of Bad. And then basically hides in a cupboard. So, and, and then basically Nurgle hides in a cupboard. So opposing factions who worship each of the sons, Orcus and Set, have set up shop down there looking for the thing so that their respective deities can rise up and gain power. Now, given that Nurgle needed a bunch of risen dead to protect the tablet, he had to do it somewhere where a lot were available. So he asked his mate Dez, and uh, Dez chose a site which was basically a huge field of ancient tombs covered by barrow mounds, hence barrow maze. It's clever, which is a nice coincidence because people are often buried with their treasured stuff. So the money, the PCs and, and the jewels and all of that that they're trying to loot, they can uh, they can find it down there and also go about saving the world. So it's, it's, a, it's convenient. Very. Now, out of the hundreds upon hundreds of uh, mounds you can uh, you can explore... Uh, only about 15 of them are entrances to the actual dungeon beneath the field of tombs. And each of the entrances are hidden under barrow mounds. So the players have to go around digging up graves full of zombies to find a way in, then find... Imagine... The that's quite fun, isn't it? Um, no. Imagine doing that and how tiresome that would be. Yeah, so you, you can feel the digging. There, yeah, I think it's supposed to be this thing of, like, tireless work. And to be fair, I'm exaggerating. There's only about 65 entrances to the fucking thing. Oh, only 65. But 15 of them are actual entrances, you know, and, uh, and uh, but, but 65, there's 65 barrow mounds, most mm. of which are just your standard tombs. 15 of them are entrances to the big tomb of the real maze, right? Right. Now, if you, like me, are really fucking smart and great and handsome, you would have noticed a problem already, right? So when you go down there, you fight cultists, zombies, what else? Well, fuck all, actually. So maybe the odd roving adventurer or frogmen from the nearby swamp, but the roster of combatants in Barrow Maze is really fucking small. Undermountain had a kind of shitty contrived reason for having all these different monsters together, but in a game where fighting and exploring is the main fucking thing, it's kind of necessary to have a bit of decent variety of things to hit or places to explore. And that's the other thing. It's just tombs, tombs, and more fucking tombs. That's all it is. And actually, the maze itself, once you manage to get in, is basically the same as a tomb, but long. Right? <laughs> so, there is... <laughs> so, like, Shaquille O'Neal's tomb, basically. Yeah, it, well, more like a tomb, but sort of designed by a maniac. So, it's, like, got, you know, hallways that lead to nowhere. Way more dead people in it than makes sense. So how many games does this run at? Because I could like, I think this would be quite a good two gamer. Uh, well, considering the size of it, it's it's at least ten before you get bored of it. That's so and if you actually man. wanted to do it, probably fifty to sixty. No, nah, I'm good. <laughs> there is one reason though that I think this setting is worth taking a look at, and uh, the the actual setting around the fucking thing is really fucking good, and even the story behind the whole thing, it's not bad. The surrounding swampy er areas are like dark and gruesome and scary, and a hell of a lot of fun to explore. And additionally, the nearby towns are brimming with like really fucking great characters, all of which are statted. And there's like a local militia in a place called Iron Guard Mott, and there's Bog Town which is this shitty town that grew up in the area, which you guys will remember from our Lamentations campaigns. Yes. 
And basically, yeah, because so many people were coming to explore the fucking dungeon and try and get rich, a local sort of cottage industry built up around this trade. So there's like this town where, you know, you can buy adventuring gear, there's inns to stay and things like this, and it grew up because the Barrow Maze is there. And they served spaghetti barra maize in the... <laughs> no, I've, uh, that joke okay. wasn't good enough to warrant three times, no, was it? it wasn't. Shut up now. Okay. There's also more locations nearby to adventure besides the maze itself, and the whole thing has this sort of like grimy feel to it. It's all fog, darkness, and grim characters, and a great setting for a horror-themed mega dungeon. It's a shame, then, that the concept is so flawed, because the more, majority of the... Jam- because the majority of the game consists of doing the same thing over and over and over, right? I mean, that's yeah, that's, that's that would be a difficult sell to your players, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. And you know the the podcast, uh, the Delvers, they play Barrow Maze on there, and I quite like it, but mostly for the table banter. Well, yeah, but the thing is, it's 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 unique with with the Delvers because obviously they're playing it with their kids. And yeah, exactly. That's what makes it fucking entertaining because he's he, basically the way he runs it yeah. is just your bog standard like. It's like, well, it's it's all like methodical. It's like, yeah. okay, you can dig this amount of mud in a day, then you go back to the end, blah, 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 resources, etc. Yes, but, but that's quite good because it's sort of um, it's teaching a lot. Yeah, and, and that's quite entertaining to hear. The but the kids, you know, they really get into their characters and oh, they're like, yeah. oh, I've got a dog, and he's got, and it's, anyway, it's really cute and it's really cool. But, uh, and this is this is a good thing, right? So, so, um, this is, I mean, this is cool, right? This is a cool thing about it because, you know, it's just, it's basically a long tomb and then several short tombs over and over and over again for 50 sessions. And I think that's why I set the price at £50, uh, not including well, postage. Wow. Well, that's, that's less than a pound a tomb, I think. So, <laughs> we, we, well, why would you? <laughs> Got to collect them all. Here's the thing, but would you pay 50p for a two-room tomb? If the answer is yes then seek help, but it's, also buy this. If we're talking of fictional tombs, but no, I mean, this, this for, is If all, it was a real fucking tomb, I'd be well up for it. But if, I mean, you know, I mean, I wouldn't pay £50 for it, but I think this should be like a four game thing. I think, like, when the boredom reaches its height, you know, get them in there, you know, like, you know but then, I mean? but then you have to remember that, that it's it's specifically it's, made not to be a four game thing, and it's oh, but yeah, it's yeah. it's so dull it's and boring. It's made to be a very long, challenging, arduous process. But I think I think in a, I, in a fucking fantasy that. game, right? Once you reach a certain, once you level up, the things you're fighting should be varied and challenging and different, right? But what happens at level one in a Barrow Maze campaign, and what happens at level fifteen in a Barrow Maze game campaign, is exactly the same fucking thing. Except with more monsters. Yeah, but well, um, no, though, because it would just be more zombies. Well, this well, is like be, a big floor. Well, it'd be isn't more, it? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, well, yeah, that's zombies. what it is. It is a big floor. <laughs> oh, get out! But yeah, this adventure basically it takes months of play and includes like three hundred rooms. But take one look at this, and you'll see, as Sean rightly mentioned, it's a one-shot or short campaign concept stretched so thin you can fucking see through it. The descriptions of the rooms and what they contain remind me of adventures like Keep on the Borderlands and Palace of the Silver Princess, which are good adventures, but they were created in such a way that the GM is supposed to insert his own story and fit the rooms to his campaign, and those are also small products for less than 15 quid. This is a £50 product with brief characterless descriptions of essentially the same three types of room over and over. And what's funny, if you look at the page for the game on DTRPG, this description includes a link to a video where a guy who's clearly got like buyer's remorse tries to justify the price by talking about the amount of rooms that it has. Uh, it's like, look, 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 a mega dungeon can be a good idea, but more rooms doesn't necessarily equal more good. So why have they charged fifty pounds for it? Then? Because, well, because it took them fucking their whole life to write it because it's so massive. That and also it's a very, very well presented book. It looks nice, and I think the art budget was how he justified the stupid. It. Bear in mind, you could get the player's handbook for D and D for twenty five pounds. So this yeah. guy's, and this is for available for five e. So it's a supplement for the game that costs as much as two of the books combined. Well, that's good. That's good selling, that is, isn't it? That's, I mean, I mean, but the trouble is, I bought it, so I'm a fucking idiot. Yeah, but you bought it for this, for this. Yeah, well, when, when I actually, I bought it to use, then sold it, then I, 
well, I luckily downloaded the PDF when I fucking bought it. So uh, for this review, that's what I used. But yeah, I sold it to um, Bruce Cunnington, who's quite famous in DCC circles. And um, I don't think he's opened it yet and looked at it because... Oh, yes, I remember this. Because for two reasons. Firstly, if he did read it, he'd probably call me up asking for a refund. And secondly, I went through a phase of including strange pictures of myself in the back of books I sent to people who bought it. Yeah, in a random page inside. So it was... My mum was here and she was encouraging me to do it and I had a fruit bowl on my head and was smiling like a really weird smile. And uh, that's in there somewhere so I don't think he's actually opened it and that's probably for the best so Baramaze what are we thinking yay or nay it's good um, again to be used as a room um, encyclopedia type thing sort of though but not as good as undermounting because no. the, the, the the encounters are just the same three encounters over and over again no no you're right there so Sean what do you think of Baramaze uh, Baranose Baron yeah. Maze or Baron Nose? Uh, yeah, I'd say Baron Nose. Uh, I'd say Barra stay away from this because <laughs> it is not that good. Well, that's some Sorry, really I, fine wisdom there, Sean. I mean, I had all this cool stuff to say in my head, but, you know, we've already... We've, but it just didn't, when it got to the mouth, something happened. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Didn't. But, you know, the good thing about Baron Maze, though, as well, is that, obviously, you know, you know, like... You know maps of dungeons, like old school dungeons? They don't even include drawings. It's just the layout, right? The yeah. boxes. You do get that with a game, um, which is cool. You know, you get the high quality JPEG map that you can... Pre- oh, actually, got a call from the producer coming in. Uh, you don't you don't get that. You have to pay for the maps separately. You have what? To pay How for much? The How much what? is them? Seven pound. Ten dollars. Ten dollars for the map? Yep. Each? No, it's just for the one one layout of the floor. Oh, I fuck. think you get the surrounding area too, but yeah. So, I want to uh, get the map for 50 quid, man. I'm like, Jesus Christ. No, the map's not 50 quid. The book's 50 quid. The map's $10. Not in the book. They should put the map in the book. Well, the map's in the book, but if you want an actual copy to print I and want use... I tore out the map from the book. Yeah, so they tore out... No, the ba- the, Sean, the map's in the book. But if you want right. the high-res JPEG version to print out to use you have to pay extra and uh, that's they sh- no <laughs> so they should no yeah and Greg Gillespie who designs it he's a good game designer he's done really good fucking dungeons like the Bastion of the Bogglings but uh, bloody Baramaze Excellent. it sucks it sucks anus <laughs> So and uh, so because we got two so far so it's, it's a nil nil for mega dungeons right under mountain no but maybe Baramaze no and you know this problem that Greg Gillespie has in Baramaze, it exists in every well-regarded well-regard- mega dungeon, taking some huge underground structure and making every room meaningful would take years and years. Stone Hell. That's another right, re- highly regarded mega dungeon. And So Stone Hell is a labyrinth lord mega dungeon and it features bare bones design and just enough to get it going. So the story is essentially this, lads. Stone Hell was a prison and loads of sentient beings were held captive there. Like orcs, ghasts, ghouls, all of them were held prisoner there. So, what happened one day? Uh, somebody bought Stonehell. It changed hands, or somebody got it in a will, or whatever, and all the bad guys got released. But the trouble is, is they can't find their way out. So, ten years later, some of the monsters have formed gangs, set up micro economies, and a kind of social ecosystem has formed amongst this. Uh, gigantic prison i like this premise already me too um so each room is described minimally and as are the reasons for the beasts or people being there the book actually says it's so that you can insert in your own meaning or backstory and even suggest cutting parts of the dungeon out to use as one shots which i really like like i appreciate the honesty do you know what i mean yeah and greg gillespie's like he's like Look, this is this is a fucking masterpiece you're gonna pay 50 fucking quid for but the Stonehell guys they're saying look you're not probably not gonna play all of this cut bits out use it it's not got much story but you're welcome to insert that in there and he's got a good reason for all the monsters being there too which yeah. is rare in this yeah that, that reason that really really works as well yeah exactly I like it and uh, it's pretty generic it's a cool little toolbox but it suffers from the same problems the other two we've spoken about like which is to say that it lacks any real character or meaning however how fucking ever it is actually a decent price 12 quid from Lulu is it? So you know what I mean. It's like if you want to nab a book to use for quick and dirty dungeons, it's a good, it's a good way to go. How many pages is this one? I don't know this because is... I am not. I don't research. 
This stuff. is a good route, though. This is a good route, the toolbox route, I think. Yeah, because, it's just basically, here's yeah. a big fucking it's dungeon layout done. with some decent encounters yeah. in it, and it's, it's... It's done what we're saying should be done in the case of having exactly. a mega dungeon. Because it doesn't have... What we've found, really, is that mega dungeons lack any real story depth. So if you just accept that and go, look, I know it has loads of rooms, but it's not worth 50 quid. It is worth about 12. And Stonehell, you know, it is that price. So it's a good way to go. There is, however, one giant gaping problem with Stonehell. I mean, it's a good fucking thing. But why would you go down to Stonehell to explore? Because it's not like there's many riches down there. It was a prison, right? And it's got its own oh, yeah. economy now. Why would you go into the prison... Well, well, yeah, so unless you want some ramen noodle packets or Well, if they've fags got their own whatever. economy, then that means there are riches. Yeah, but, yeah, no, but it'd be like, it'd be you. like you know, in prisons how they trade ramen noodle packets. It'd be like that. It'd be something that outside of Stonehill is utterly worthless. No, but it's a prison to them because they can't escape it. But or are you trying to, are you trying to free them? Is that the point? Well, yeah, I mean, you could have that as the story, couldn't you? That could be another reason for going down there, but the... The richest thing doesn't work. So, Sean, let's say, for example, right, you're not, you're not, you're not getting this. If, say, for example, you go down a dungeon, right? Yeah. You open a chest. There's a hundred ramen noodle packets in there. Yeah, but you're. Well, then you go into this weapon shop, yeah, wanting you're... a new glaive. Wait a second. I've just realised a bigger flaw about it all. If it's taken them ten years to not escape, yeah, it's going to take you a minimum of ten years to try and find them. Yeah, but you. Hmm. <laughs> I think I've just fucking fucked it. Well, yeah, because if it's that fucking complicated, yeah. you you haven't got a chance. No. Uh, well, unless you leave some breadcrumbs. Yeah, but then that's the currency, so it'll get picked back up. You know, yeah, it's like that's true. I'll run then the rat the people will start nibbling at it. Yeah, exactly. Rat fault, yeah. So yeah, I mean, is this for Dungeons and Dragons also? Well, Labyrinth Lord. So oh, any okay. any basic expert Dungeons Dragons like old school stuff okay cool. but uh, yeah I mean you can add your own reason in for you know the players going all down there it would easy it, and you know it would be easy for me to call this product lazy right because it uses the same old fantasy monsters in a generic fashion drags it out over 10 floors in 120 rooms a piece but it's 12 quid and it's more fair for something like this where the real point is that it's just a dungeon layout that you can use if you were stuck for ideas or have no time to write one up yourself. If Barrow Maze was 12 quid, I'd say buy that too, but it ain't. And there's a big difference in art quality between Barrow Maze and Stonehill and I suspect, as I've said, that that's the reason why Barrow Maze costs that stupid amount. <laughs> so we've spoken about two mediocre mega dungeons and one overpriced lazy cash grab. But what about uh, what about good ones, lads? Uh, what about are we are we going to talk about the Alice in Wonderland one? Not technically a mega dungeon, no, it's a hex crawl. Ah, yeah. I was, ah. Looking, I was looking forward to that because it's mo- it, Yeah, it's it's a great one, and that is a hex crawl that could take months and months of play, right? But it's it's basically all wilderness stuff. Mm. Yeah, so it doesn't really work. Sorry, Sean. Cool. What mega dungeons you got for us? All right, here we go. I'll lay them on you. Uh, so it's my opinion that most of these things fail because the concepts are stretched too thin, right? I mean, we've seen that today. Yep. So either you get content that's absurdly samey or you get something where you have shitty reasons for a bunch of different monsters being about. But so here's my tip. Knowing this about mega dungeons, what can we do to fix it? Let's take the undermount, an undermounting template of stupid reason all these mod- monsters are here in the same cave and lean into it make it stupid go crazy so the one i've got to recommend is chalt by venger satanus by venger satanus this is a cracking fiant fiant santa setting with a mega dungeon and it's comprised of like 120 rooms where the laws of the universe it's like cthulhu mythos in a big black pyramid that appears in a wasteland one day and none of the rooms make much sense because it's like inside the Black Pyramid reality breaks down time works so like differently each door is technically like a different dimension type kind of shit that's how he's designed it so each room basically can differ entirely in theme to every other room so like it's, it's like this is like a backdrop of post-apocalyptic Cthulhu mythos science fantasy wastelands and the main dun- dungeon this huge Black Pyramid you can en- encounter the insane clown posse in one room wait and that's written in that's in there. Wow, that is fucking. Then in uh, mental, an adjacent room, you might fight fruit ninjas. Yeah, there's a cinema in one of them for some reason. But, okay, I'm liking this. 
a little bit because it's fucking absolutely gonzo. It's great, yeah. It's proper gonzo science fantasy, that, and that's actually kind of what it calls itself. But the cool thing is, is that there's this overarching like a way to run Chalt, which is like kind of that there are no coincidences because it's it's Cthulhu mythos and it's supposed to make you feel small and insignificant. If the players ever feel like they've encountered something coincidental, like uh, there's two rooms that have insane clown posses or whatever, you're supposed to play it up and be like, oh, that is weird. Or like, you know, there are no coincidences. You have to come up for a, with a reason why two things that are seemingly unrelated and now related like it's kind of cool it's a great book and it's got like loads of these like little uh helpful tools in there like mutation tables and shit like this so it's really great and a lot of pop culture references in there there's a dharma initiative are in one of the rooms so uh you know lost references in 2021 <laughs> um right. But yeah, it's a cracking one. It really leans into the bizarre nature of Mega Dungeons and to the silly aspects of role-playing. And it's a better product for it. Um, also, a quick nod to Subsurface... Hang on a minute. Subsurface... An, an, anomalous Subsurface Environment. That's a good one. Okay. Uh, wait, what? what uh, is so, it hard right to elaborate? So this is a Mega Dungeon in a science fantasy world... And basically, underground, there's there's this big anomaly, scientific anomaly, where it's a, a mega dungeon just suddenly appeared underground, and you you're sort of going in for scientific reasons, trying to figure out what's going on. But it's a game where the setting basically is where like the the world went through an apocalypse and then came back to fantasy stuff. So you've got lasers alongside people wearing loincloths and holding swords and stuff. Oh, that's good. That is good. Yeah, and the cover... I didn't actually get much of a chance to read the whole thing, but the cover features a man shooting a gorilla with a laser. Oh, well... Sold. 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 Yeah. I've learned actually a good way for checking if an adventure is good. Does it have a gorilla on the cover? If the answer is yes... Good adventure. Tell or, me, tell me one adventure with a gorilla on the cover that's bad. That's a good point, actually. Right. Uh, um, wait, wait, no. The, Donkey the, Kong I'm, RPG. Oh, don't, mate, don't, don't, don't be slagging off don't, the don't, don't, don't tempt me, man. I wonder if there's a Donkey Kang thing on this fucking meme soundboard. Oh, mate, that'll be the, that'll be the most used. Oh yeah. So Donkey Kong RPG. But yeah, that is it for Mega Dungeons. Let's have a little natter about a couple of Max. Pour me a cup of... Oh, fuck. I was just about to do a rhyme. Right, so let's have a little natter about Mega Dungeons. What do we think? Sean, you ever going to run one? Do you think they're great or are they just shit? They can be great in the right hands. They're not just shit, I don't think. Um, I think um, leaning into the toolbox thing was a good idea. But also there are a couple that are really good. And you can have a good mega dungeon. You just have to make the rooms interesting, I think. Uh, if you're going to make one yourself, go for a Legend of Zelda type feel, I think. Yeah. Uh, with like nice puzzles in there. Um, and if you don't want to do that, uh, maybe go for like a Persona type feel. Uh, where you'll, you know, like a nice dungeon run. Uh, you get out of there, you do some life shit, you go back in. You know, uh, well, I mean that that goes hand in hand with role playing games. For those that don't know, you've got to sort of explain what you're saying sometimes, right? That's what I was explaining. Right, but Persona uh, is a game where it's basically separated between. It's that, a video game. That is a good example of. It is a games. it is a great example actually because, yeah, you do your school life shit and then you go into the dungeon randomly generated dungeons. Uh, in Persona Three, for example, there's this huge black tower that's appeared in i think it's tokyo but i don't remember and you do your school life and then in the evening you conquer this dungeon and there's a hundred levels but every five levels the theme changes and it's about something else and that's yeah it's a great example and also a great tip if you want to make a fucking good one make sure you have like distinct areas do you know what i mean yeah. barrow maze is just one big tomb no, that, that, that sounds... Where, whereas in persona 4 you have like one area that's uh, a gay sauna uh, yeah, and the monsters change, like you say, the theme changes, uh, things become different and difficult, uh, there is the personal struggle, so yeah, I'd, I'd either lean into the story very much, or just nick some stuff and use some stuff, I'd say. Yeah, 
well, nick some stuff and use some stuff. Great advice. Um, but yeah, I, I think Persona's like the model, isn't it? Because it's the the story is all done during the downtime, and the action is when you're in the dungeon. And it's not a bad thing to just have a hack and slash game as long as the characters can actually be characters outside yeah. of the mega dungeon. Do you know what I mean? But James, what do you think? Well, I think there's either two points. One is you either find your audience, find your people... Do you want to tackle it, right? You're going to tackle it, so you're going to do it as written and you're going to go through it. You're going to have some downtime because otherwise you're not going to be able to, you know, replenish your gear and that. Mm. But perhaps you will skip over the route that you took, you know, to go back into town and then go back in just for gameplay ability. But eventually the ultimate goal, if you find your audience for it, is to complete it, even though it's in- incompletable. Otherwise, all you have to do is um, you have to take liberties with it. It's like yeah. it's written like this. It's boring. It's the same room, right? But you're running it, so change it. Make it change. Make it evolve. Make it evolve with the characters and with the story. Yeah. If it just so happens that um, they feel like it's naturally coming to an end, maybe it's coming to uh, a boss area or something like yeah, that. Like it, yeah, like I know what you mean. Like if you if you get to the point, say running Baron Maze, where the players are getting bored and they feel like they're right near it. Yeah. Maybe just go the next next session they're finding the boss because room. as it's a maze that means there's more than one way of getting there so they could just have found the shortest route that annoyed me as well because the the actual tablet of chaos in barra maze it doesn't it's not labeled on the map where it is right yeah. and in these games it's all about methodical exploration of a dungeon right so you're the players are mapping it out the players are writing things down on they map and then you're going through the... Ta- but it's like... Well, one thing I wanted to know was where the Tablet of Chaos actually is. Unless you read every room description, you won't know. So that's annoying. Could you put it into like... Um, get the PDF and just do a Control F and find it. Yeah, I could have done that. <laughs> I could have done that. That's a good point. Uh, I was uh, wondering, have either of you watched the anime Is It Wrong to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon? I've seen it advertised. I watched it, an episode with you, I believe. Uh no, you haven't. Okay. Um, what was that one we what was that one of several animes that we watched that was about a person going down a dungeon? Going down a dungeon. Because we watched I that time I reincarnated as a slime. Then yeah, there's that one about that girl that played an online game and went into dungeons and she was like a hentai. Oh, that was really good because she was like actually like just a normal character. I can't even remember that one. But that was good. Um, no, I was t- yeah, because that's like they they uh, in this uh, anime. I might have to actually watch it. Uh, it is actually a mega dungeon, right? But then, okay, so maybe maybe had you watched it, you could have come up with some advice there. But what you're saying is the advice is if that's a good anime, copy it. If not, don't. I, I was actually yeah. I was I was still banking on the fact that either of you have watched it. But given the title, person watches this least is anime a- out in this room. Yeah, you two love anime. James, you like porn movies as well. <laughs> Sean, you're <laughs> Sean, Sean, you're very much into your um, really extreme like- hentai and conspiracy theories. What, yeah. um, what? conspiracy hentai? But anyway, so t- t- the tip is watch that anime, and then if it has shut up, <laughs> if it has good ideas in it, but, then take the ideas. But, but if it doesn't, don't. But I'm not into. The, I'm not into. Well, hentai. You know, don't explain I, yourself. I, I like. I like. I like. Uh, <laughs> right. He's definitely watches that stuff. Savage. But anyway, uh, so yeah, Mega Dungeons, I guess, yeah, take a, Sean's advice is great. Take a leaf from the Persona games and have the dungeons change and be interesting. And James, make it make it your own was your sort of advice yeah. as well. If you're running Barra Maze, put special infected in there. Put special types of zombies. Do that. My advice would be not to run one. <laughs> That's a lot simpler, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, but I don't I think I found any any really good ones because the concept is always stretched so well, thin. To be honest, like you know, the whole point, and like even Sean's suggestion and my suggestion, is you're not running those, are you? You're not. You're you're taking the idea and you're running your own fucking mega dungeon, aren't? You? Yeah. So yeah. Or like you're trying to use that system, but then you're just you. If you're just constantly changing it, then you're no longer actually running what it originally was. So then why buy it in the first place? Yeah, so it does go to your um, suggestion of just don't do it. Because I also think, like, <laughs> the layouts are so fucking shit as well. It's like, so often, it's like, it, I couldn't tell the difference in terms of the layout. You know, like, if you're in a dungeon, like, if you read any fucking DCC dungeon, right, 
there's all this context behind it, right? They're like the um, uh, the croaking fane where you go into the frog dungeon, right? There's all this context. You see paintings on the walls that give it his tree or Sailors on the Starless Sea where there's this underground cult or whatever, right? There's always this context. Whereas, like, I often find that... <laughs> The, so the dungeons, if they if they're going to be good, especially a mega one, have to have context. And often, if the rooms are placed in a certain way, you've got to think about why they placed in that way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's got to be an actual believability. It can't to just it. be nonsensical because otherwise you're just going to be like, yeah, well. But seriously, go to, go to the random dungeon generator online called Don John. Right, go to that, generate a random one, and ch- uh, and I'll get one from another game and let's see which one you think is the real one because mega dungeon layouts are shit they're really shit and they're no different from those randomly generated ones and they're free so just fucking get one of those the yeah, dungeon is really is is a good tool if you want to so if, if you're not if you haven't got like a sort of idea of a layout or something just whack a few things into there and just just have a look just yeah. have a look and just get some idea yes yeah, good talk good but talk. i'm mostly anyway we've asked the guys what uh the the listeners what they think about mega dungeons and uh we're in the electro letter segment so should we go there now i think we should in the future you will be able to send a letter or parcel from anywhere on the planet this, sir, is the Electro Letter. So Lewis Pineda, he says, Mega Dungeons seems completely illogical to me. I still think that a dungeon had to have served a purpose before being abandoned for one reason or another. The mad wizard that just keeps one for fun doesn't seem to make sense. I think if it was bought to my players, they would just contract masons to seal the entrances. Yeah, so crack. that's See, a good idea because then it will stop people ever going in there and dying. And also, again. it's it's also the smartest way to solve the barrow maze in a one shot. Yeah, because it's also yeah because those monsters can't get out. Hang on, there'll be an apocalypse if somebody finds that fucking thing. Well, let's seal the entrances up with concrete. Lewis, Perfect, you're done. A genius. Yes, thank you, Lewis. And you're absolutely right. We this is what we just said. It's like fucking. It fucking it annoys me that how how little of them actually make sense, you know. Well, uh, I think when uh, you did it, it was quite good. I mean, it wasn't a mega dungeon. We only but, played parts of it, though. Uh, no, no. I mean, Baramays, yeah. I mean, that was a bit shit. But um, like we had fun playing Baramays, but um, it was very different. But um, what I meant was um, a guy that keeps dungeons for fun. So you had oh, a, I did do that, yeah. So you had a bloke that had... Tied all the things people tell you not to do. <laughs> um, he had a, a, a dungeon experience we went through, uh, and it turned out to be um, a, a lot of trickery, basically. Yeah, so essentially this guy, like, if you wanted the experience of a dungeon without actually doing it, he it's like, you know, those haunted houses you can go and visit at theme parks? Yep. He just basically made those so you could feel like you're having a real adventure and paid actors to sort of jump out at you and go, Bleh! and uh, yeah, they killed one of them. So, well, that went well. So yeah, I mean, but if, yeah, because if it is an inherently silly idea, lean into it. Do you know what I mean? That's what Chalt did and that's why it's fucking good. But you need to have a bit of, I don't know, a bit of... Uh bit of like you know steak you know I think. yeah well and and that's often the problem isn't it because undermounting you don't know who that fucking guy is you don't care about him and then suddenly you meet him in the final counter and he's like and he's just like hello i've been and, expecting you right exactly <laughs> uh michael markey says a mega dungeon can be great if you keep it a living breathing location there needs to be factions plots and events that compete for the player's attention I'm about a year and a half into a weekly Stone Hell campaign. Wow. And it's been great in this regard. At their worst, Mega Dungeons can earn the epithet Monster Closets. Bryce Lynch at t- a 10 Foot Pole, which is a blog, written loads about the good and bad of Mega Dungeons. So go and check that out, 10footpole.org. And yeah, I, I, I agree. Monster Closets are boring because it's just roll and shiv, another fight. You go into the next room, roll and shiv, another fight. Yeah, but this bloke has cr- basically done what we've sort of, the advice we've given out is to, if you're going to do a mega dungeon, one of the ways you should do it is make a world that is the dungeon. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. That's why they often feature factions and things. And Stonehell is great for that because they've thought about the reason and they've gone. There are gangs formed. There's yeah. gangs of gnolls and orcs and They're things really like that. Yeah, so I can see why he's been playing it for a year and a half. Well done, man. That's pretty fucking good. 
Yeah. Robert Woford, he says he's never judged a mega dungeon. Um, we've just judged, what, how many? Four? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that that will only be funny to people that know DCC because the uh, DM's called the judge in that game. But I tried to play Under Mountain when it first came out. The GM was a real big on one of us mapping so he could laugh at us because there were teleport traps all over the place and you couldn't tell that you'd been shifted. Yeah, but that's just fucking out. That's cunty. That is, that is proper prick. Imagine going right? through a doorway, right? You've drawn the next yeah. room that he's described and then you find out it's actually you nowhere near the room. That you're, you're trying just... to trace your steps back. Wait a second. Surely it would still make sense if you trace your steps back. Unless the unless the teleporter transported you somewhere random every time. Well, unless they're random portals. Yeah, but yeah. Okay, don't do that. Yeah, just don't put teleporters don't do in that. a dungeon. <laughs> just don't do it. If it involves mapping, don't fucking do it. That's a shit idea. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, he finishes with not sure I would ever try either side of that ever. So yeah, fair enough. <laughs> James Tomasson comes in with an email. He is the Cunt. one. <laughs> He is the one member of our group that hasn't been a guest on this podcast. And we did invite him on for Morg Borg, but he said he didn't have anything to offer. But he's Bless him. A, yeah. Well, we need to get him on here, but I don't know what he yeah, could... Cause he's I a don't big, think he listens to this at all, ever. Well, I, well, I'm surprised he's commented then. But um, the thing about it is, is that he is, ladies and gentlemen, is he's the D&D guy of the group. If he could play D&D every day and suck Matt Mercer's fat anus, he would definitely do it. <laughs> but um, but we like him, and he's he he's very short. So, so he's not well, very to do with very short isn't. <laughs> well, it doesn't have much to he's do with not anything. Very short. He's like five foot seven. That's just no, like, he fucking isn't. That's a bit short. The reason I say that is because when you introduce somebody, you're supposed to tell the, an interesting fact about them, <laughs> and he's three foot one. He's that is a he's small. Three foot one. Um, <laughs> no, he's about five foot seven. He's about three foot two. Let's meet in the middle. He's, he's you know, is is all right. Fair enough. But, but maybe he, we could get him on an episode yeah. about hobbits. He's, he's at work, Dave. He's slightly. <laughs> he's, Hello, I'm James <laughs> Sebastian. He's at, I don't know. Why I'm defending him so much, but he's slightly shorter than everyone else. Yeah, that's that's literally it. He was and really Harrison poked at him by like just you know just as a nice little quip. But he's a, he's he a, got really hurt. No, because James Tomasson was getting drunk, drunker by the second, and I and Ryan was like, "How come you're so pissed already?" And I'm like, "He's three foot one, mate." <laughs> and I thought it was going to be a funny joke, but J- J- Tomasson just turned around and went, "Hey, I'm not three foot one." Like he was actually hurt. <laughs> yeah. And we met. I'm sure I met up with him later that week in the pub. And while we were sitting there, I was like, "Look, loads of short people are cool, mate." Like making more of a joke out of it. And I, and I compared him to Vern Troyer, who played Minami in Doctor oh, Powers. No. Doctor Powers, Austin Cause, Powers. Because you see, uh, uh, Edward Elric is four foot eleven. So, um, oh, sorry, nobody knows who that is. Nobody cares the about Full Metal, Metal Alchemist. The Full Metal Alchemist from Full Metal all right. Alchemist. All right, we need a jingle. Sh- embarrassing Sean fact time. Again, is that right? Um, no, it's not all right. So one time we were at a game. Wait, why are we talking about this? Can we just talk about Full Metal Alchemist? Well, this is related to that. Okay, fair. this is related to that. So one time, so Sean, when he watches anime, he believes everything that's in it. Right? Can we say Wait, that? No, so one no, time, really. one time we were talking about a film that included time travel, and Sean just randomly burst out. Well, I got time travel wrong. <laughs> and I was like, "What Wait, do you mean? Do no. you mean?" Do you mean, like, based on the knowledge you learned from the anime Steins Gate? Um, and he was like, yeah, yeah, actually. Well, actually... You part, thought... In part from Steins Gate, because... Uh, okay. Because they mentioned well, string theory to make it seem more plausible. But actually, uh, sorry, but, Sean, but you can't time travel by putting a m- banana in a microwave. Joe Barner. Anyway, uh, right, so um, I can't remember what I was going to say now. But, yeah, Steins Gate is good... Because um, you know um, there is some. <laughs> this truth. is so weird. Some, what are we going there, to now? There is some truth behind the time travel. No, there Steins isn't. Gate. To James uh, is nodding at Sean like, "Yep, carry on, carry on digging um, that hole." Yeah, uh, there is some truth. Uh, yeah, and you know they. Uh, Why are you still it, going on? And it was quite nice because everyone, <laughs> everyone was like, "Oh, this is complicated. There is too much science." And I was just like laying back, like, "Yeah, I, I know, I know this science." No, there's you barely know? any science in it, Sean. Um, what about the part where like she holds an entire seminar basically just talking about science the whole time <laughs> yeah but <laughs> it's basically talking about theoretical time travel from the point of pop science um, and you believed it 100% F- 
But why? Why, I if mean, you maybe, believed that they done that, this anime had unlocked the secret to time travel, uh, why didn't you try it? I, well, I mean, and go back and save the time you spent watching watching anime. Uh, well, n- no regrets, and also, <laughs> like, I don't know because I don't want to risk using a microwave. And um, right, this is going stupid now. I, right, I, Giuseppe Raton. Uh, we didn't even. We didn't I'd even have fucking to attach a we- PS2 to a microwave. Shut up. So uh, we didn't even ask, ask, ask James this question. This is going on so long. The understanding between the DM and players that it is a death trap. That's what makes it good. Multiple adventuring parties after the old one dies or a player survives fleeing, providing a little bit of mapping. So this is one cool thing like, yeah, it's a death trap. And that's the whole overarching thing of it. But also like when your characters die, yeah, you will start several levels back or whatever. But you keep the map that you've done up to that point. And the way I've seen it done is like when everyone goes back to the inn, all of the adventurers carve what they saw that day into the table in the oh, middle of the so inn. So they all work together. Yeah, so it's in a like collaborative a collaborative way. Exactly, exactly. But then you might get some snakes in there. So it's sort of the politics of it. I think it's a good idea. But does that mean he is Tomasin um, suggesting that a lot of separate D&D groups play part of the dungeon and then share their finds? Because that, I mean, I've, I, I if we did that about, for like two sessions, that would be quite interesting. Well, it, well, there's a famous players, isn't he? Like the ones that die. Yeah, it's the next characters. Yeah, but, but, but I have, I had. There was, there is a story about that because in in uh, uh, Knights of the Dinner Table comics, there was this guy that ran two parties in the same world, and what they, what one party did, also affected the other. It's two separate players, right? And so one party knew that the other party was going around uh, trying to figure out where, what they'd done in the dungeon, see if they've hidden anything, see if they can get to the treasure before the other party. So the rival party started a rumour that uh, there was this thing called the Head of Vecna down in a dungeon, right? And it was basically because there's a, an item called the Hand of Vecna and you have to chop off your own hand, put it on there, get the powers of the magical item, right? So one of the parties started a rumour that the Head of Vecna was a thing, and even put like a fake head down in the dungeon. And so the party believed the rumour, went down there, one of them chopped their own head off and tried to quickly put the new head on (laughs) and uh, obviously died. Then all the other players thought that he'd just done it wrong and so were trying it again and in a heartbeat, one party wiped out the other. But I would love to do that. I would love to do that if I had enough friends. So, uh, yeah, but I know that would be great. Like, imagine having a mega dungeon and maybe two parties are coming in from different entrances. Yeah. That would be fucking awesome. Oh, I've just, I've just made it bearable. You have. You have. I win. Uh, Giuseppe <laughs> Rotondo, he says, I'm currently tentatively designing one for old school essentials. Hope it won't suck. Uh, news for you, Giuseppe. Great guy, but uh, it probably will. Yeah, so stop. <laughs> just stop it. Stop. They're not very good. Uh, right, so uh, let's. Uh, we've got time for one more here. Brent Alt, he says, it's called anomalous subsurface environment and shut your fucking mouth. So we got to give that one a try. That's his example of a good one. You're really mean. We did actually get a, 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 a communique in from Connor Warden, a fantastic GM, and he's written a, basically a thesis for us on Mega Dungeons. And he happens to be one of the only people that I've ever played in a game who did a mega dungeon, and it was amazing. In a one shot. In a one shot, he did. Yeah, he did a mega dungeon in three hours just by keeping it really quick. Like, okay, you go into the next room. What do you do next? And blah blah blah. It was fucking great. Yeah, he's 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 one of the uh, sort of better G, uh, GMs at dungeons. Hmm. Sorry. That's sorry. damning with faint sorry. praise there. Well, I don't I don't know if he listens to this. So you can say you can say what you were gonna. I'm not fucking saying anything, but you can say it. No, I think no, I think he's no, I think he's really good at making dungeons. <laughs> I do like. All know. right, but tell me, what's the what's what's beneath the surface? What's underneath, Sean? What's, what's un- underneath? What's underneath? A funny little goblin guy. More dungeons. I don't no, know. what are you talking about? Well, because you're obviously you're saying no, he's good at dungeons. Sean, yeah. Have Sean. you ever watched a hentai? Um, no. That's a lie, because I know one that you've specifically watched. Oh, I watched a hentai. Do once. you play erotic visual novels? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah. Right. But so that's worse, almost, isn't it? Because like hentai is a pretty accepted art form nowadays. 
Erotic visual, erotic visual novels. Yeah, but like some of the best like, EVNs, bro. So <laughs> just EVNs. Um, no, some of the best um, visual novels have erotic things going on. But then that's Japan for you, and it. I suppose I you're not Japan. I think. I think. Right. <laughs> now, the, now the reason. Am, the reason, well, Sean. I am Japan. Shut it's up. In my heart. Shut, well, shut up. Sorry. <laughs> right. So the reason Sean is on today is because in the near future, depending on you know what happens with Nick and uh, you know his move away, because we do record in person. Uh, Sean might, might be coming on as a permanent guest. And I feel, oh. I feel as if you've really sort of dug a hole for yourself. So screwed. People now know that you believe in flat Earth, watch hentai, and think Earth. you know how time Actually, travel that's works. Worse than the hentai. I don't. Right, let's just point. Like, I don't. Do I you was, want me to just cut all the bits, including you, out of the podcast to be safe? Um, well, I sort of like screwed the interview a bit, like. Really, haven't I? It's what interview? This isn't an interview. This is sort of like an interview, isn't it? Like, I, I like. Oh, like this is your this is your test day to this see is if your you trial by fire. Well, I think we'll have you Lots back on fire. next episode, but you're not allowed to speak. Okay, yeah, there you go. You can just but so, give us like, tea. If I don't speak quietly, you know what I'm thinking. Yeah, you're thinking, man. There's a lot of good hentai on this flat Earth. Oh, now, so, now, somebody get me a time machine. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. There you go. <laughs> I could see it whirring in your head. What, what were you singing? No Don't doubt. No, sp- Don't speak, can it? Oh, right, yeah. Good band. Sh- shut up. What so, that's shut up. Cut out. That's all getting cut out. <laughs> so, <laughs> fucking... Change the world. Bye, bye, little bastard. Goodbye. So that was a podcast, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. We can definitely say that. It was definitely a podcast, and it has lowered my reputation and myself. <laughs> He's still going. But this is this this right. This is why we got you on because this is like self help for you. You have to realise that the weird things that you believe, they they're not right. But I don't. And you're not right. I don't believe. I don't believe in weird stuff. Sean, you believe you that really the whole world is a love. globe on a bloke's desk. Not uh-huh. even a globe, a, a snow globe. But the Earth is flat. That's what you believe. Fact. You believe in Men in Black being real. Um, I mean they are real. Like, they're called the. <laughs> actually, CIA. that is that is one uh, conspiracy theory I actually believe in. The Men in Black. Right, thank you. We've been the three TLBG for. <laughs> yeah. See you next time. <laughs> <laughs>